Hi, my name is Graham Waite and I'm the creator and owner of Real Life for Kids. Today I'm going to be taking you through three distinct steps. Firstly, I'm going to walk you through step by step through the game and how it's executed during your school term. The second video will show you our website and how it assists you in playing the game effectively and efficiently. And then finally, a tips and hints video which will show you how to get even more out of the game. I hope you enjoy it. The game rules provide the foundation of the game, so I think it's important that we start from there. Number one, your children are no longer going to be pupils at your school, but rather the school's employees. This means for every day that they come to their job, they're going to be paid 20 Rand. This equates to 100 Rand a week, and on top of that, they get 10% interest on any money that they have in the bank. They have their own bank account, which they can access through the Real Life for Kids website using a username and password. Here, they can look at their bank statements, they can look how much money they've got in the bank, as well as make various payments. More of that when we go through the website section of the video. If they don't come to school, for whatever reason, they don't get paid. So if they're absent, for example, for one day, they will only earn 80 Rand salary that week. They'll also lose out on a little bit of interest. What we also do is we teach them how to run a very basic cash book. We teach them a debit, credit, and a balance, as well as the interest calculation. This is really good for mathematics because just in this section, there's addition, subtraction, percentages, and because we don't work with cents in the game, they have to round off to the nearest rand. I suggest we do all of these things, go through the game rules, as well as teach the kids their cash book in the week before you start the game. In other words, the last week of the preceding term. Go through the game rules with them as a group and then teach them the basic cash book. The system does the cash book for them. It's not critical that they know how it works, but it is really helpful for them when they access their bank accounts to know what they're looking at. Not only can they earn cash for coming to school, in other words, being paid their salary, they also get money for doing good work in class. That means, for example, in maths, if they get a sum right, you could reward them with one rand per sum. In English, if they're doing a spelling test, you could reward them with one rand for every correct answer. Anything that they do at school that is positive, they get rewarded by the teachers in cash. This is right across the subject range. This means I would give my teachers some ready cash to reward the pupils for anything that they do in any subject. For example, if they do something really well in PE, get the PE teacher to give them cash for that. Unfortunately, as in life, not only is there positive, but there's also negative. If a child does something wrong in school, you take cash away from them. You find them. Okay? Very important here, number one, don't give the kids too much money. In other words, don't reward them at one time too uh, generously. And at the same time, don't fine them too much either. As a rule, I say 20 Rand for a bonus and 20 Rand for a fine maximum. We don't want the money losing its value by the kids getting too much. And at the same time, we don't want the kids to cop out the game because they're constantly being fined. It is crucial that the game is positively poised rather than used as a discipline tool to knock them down and pull them back. There are some jobs available to the pupils where they can earn extra money for doing that job during the week. The critical thing about these jobs is that they assist you, the teacher, in executing the game effectively. The jobs are as follows. We have the doctor, we have the bus conductor, we have the journalist, we have the policeman, and we have the postman. The doctor's job, as I mentioned before, if the kids don't come to school and they, for example, are sick, when they return, the doctor will consult their schedule of medical fees and treat the kid for that illness. 
they will then be required to pay a certain amount depending what was wrong with them. The doctor's job is to collect that money and hand it to the teacher at the end of the week. The bus conductor. What I haven't mentioned is that the children, because they don't have their driver's licenses, come to school on an imaginary bus every day. The lesson here is to try and teach them that coming to school or driving in a vehicle costs money. And because they don't have their driver's license, they have to come by the school bus. Out of their salary of 100 rand, they'll have to budget 2 rand a day or 10 rand a week to pay bus fare to come to work, as it were. They pay this to the bus conductor. The bus conductor's job is to collect this money and hand it to the teacher at the end of the week. They do, however, have the opportunity to write their driver's license. Here, they can go onto the website, download the driver's license booklet, study it, and if they think they're ready, they can pay 30 rand and write the driver's license test. If they pass, the incentive is they no longer pay bus fare. If they fail, they lose their 30 rand and continue to pay bus fare. They will, however, continue to pay bus fare until they have a home. They can only write their driver's license once they have a permanent residence on the board. We also have a journalist. The journalist's role is to write a weekly article on what's going on in the game. I normally use my creative writing teacher and they teach the kids about reporter style writing and how it's different to creative writing and each child then is equipped to write an article in reporter style writing about what's going on in the game. There is a template on the website and they can either put a photograph or draw a picture about what they wrote and they can put that up in the Gabble and Gossip which is the weekly newspaper which we'll tell you a little bit more about later. You have the postman. Their job is to run any errands or do anything like hand out books, hand out worksheets, anything that's required from the teacher is done by the postman for that week. For these jobs, the children get an extra day's pay. So instead of earning 100 rand a week, they'll earn 120 rand a week for doing that job. And as I said earlier, these jobs are rotated. So every child will get the opportunity to be one of these jobs at least two to three times during the course of the game. I may be the doctor this week, and in three or four weeks' time, I may be the postman. That's how the jobs operate. Up to this point, the board that sits in the classroom, either in the middle or at the back, is empty. The children have been earning cash through coming to school, through cash bonuses, and of course, through interest. After about five weeks, now we're ready for the auction. This is where the kids are going to take their money and invest it in a piece of land. We have three suburbs available for the children in which they can invest their money. We have Slim Park over here, which are the smallest properties and where most of the children will live. At the back here, we have Green Pines, which is a little bit more upmarket and the properties are slightly bigger. And in the front here, we have Spray View and Cliff View, which are the largest of the properties. Cliff View at this point will be unaffordable to any of the players and will be auctioned off later in the game. More about that later. So, how do they purchase the land? Well, they do it by means of an auction. I teach the kids very basically how an auction works. I tell them not to bid against themselves, for example. And when they're standing around bidding, they're not to make any noise, but merely either raise their hand or nod their heads if they'd like to make a bid for a property. I then gather the kids around the board, and starting with Slim Park, I individually auction off each property, trying to market them according to their position. So for example, property number one is a beautiful corner stand, nice and close to the airport, and nice and close to the CBD. And the starting price for Slim Park is 100 Rand. I then try and create some auction hype by putting pressure on the kids to bid. It is critical for the functioning of the game that every child purchases a piece of land. This needs to be impressed upon them because if they are unable to buy land, we put them on what is called welfare. 
This means we'll feed them, we'll clothe them, we'll give them shelter, but we stop paying them a salary if they don't have a piece of land. I'll talk a little bit more later about why it's critical for each child to buy a piece of land. I move through each individual plot, selling it to the highest bidder. Once we've completed Slim Park, I move across to Green Pines and I individually auction off each property. Once Green Pines is completed, we move through to the rich properties of Sprayview. Each child will then have purchased a piece of land. It's important at this point to tell you that every child needs to pay a transfer fee of 10% of their purchase price to get their property registered in the deeds book. This means if they win a property for 300 Rand, they have to pay an additional 30 Rand on top of that to ensure that they own the land. This is important to tell them up front so that they know how much money they can bid for. Because if they've got 400 Rand in their account, they can't bid up to 400 Rand because they've got to make sure they've got enough money for the transfer fee. Once they've purchased the piece of land, their name and their property price will go into the deeds book. This deeds book is available to the teacher on the website. Another really handy tip is to take a post-it marker and write down the kid's name as well as what they bought the property for and place it on the stand. In this way, the child will know exactly what property they have and where they can build. You may find yourself in a situation where children buy more than one property and there aren't enough properties to go around. In this instance, I have two properties, one over here and one over here, that can be used as additional properties. Make sure that every child gets a property. If they're not part of the auction for whatever reason, make sure that they purchase those and flatten their bank accounts for the cost of those properties. This one here in Green Pines can be divided into two and I have an extra property here in Slim Park that can be sold to those children. Don't reveal those unless you have to. Now that they've bought a piece of land, they'll be required to log into the website and pay for their land via an EFT transaction to the bank. They have exactly seven days on which to produce a home. Players that live in Slim Park have some restrictions. They can only purchase and build a house that is three centimeters by three centimeters by three centimeters big. That is all they're allowed. Players in other suburbs can build whatever size house they like, but they will pay 50 Rand for every three by three by three centimeter block that can fit into their home. It is important that players budget and build according to what they can afford. If players would like a swimming pool or a tennis court, they will pay an additional 20 Rand. However, all other additions, for example, a garage, a garden, a fence, any other buildings, those are free to the players. It's critical that the players make sure that their houses look good because at the end of the game, all of their investments are going to be purchased back at an increased fee. So for example, we will purchase back their land, we'll purchase back their house, we'll also purchase back any additions that they've made to their homes. If a player does not produce a house in seven days, they too will go on to welfare. This means that we, as, a, as the community, will provide them with food, shelter, and whatever they require, but they will not earn a salary, and essentially, this will put them out of the game. Right, it's been seven days, and the players have now brought their homes into the classroom. Now you can see this board has started to come alive. Every child has now a place to live, and now has certain other rights available to them. Firstly, they can insure their homes. The size of their property will depend on how much house insurance they pay, but house insurance is highly recommended. Why? Because at least twice during the course of the game, we need to introduce some kind of a disaster. This means after hours, once the children have gone home, 
randomly select a house from 1 to 27 and destroy it in any method you wish. You could either perform an act of arson or you could crush it or the aeroplane could miss the runway and crash into somebody's house. But have a look at our tips and hints insert in the third video of this training. What does house insurance provide? Well, if a child has house insurance and a disaster does hit their house, they're able to rebuild their home at no cost. If they don't have house insurance, they'll be required to rebuild their home and pay once again for their home on the board. There's also medical aid available to the players. Here, children can purchase medical aid for 30 Rand for the entire game, and this will mean they only have to pay 10% of the fee required for them if they are sick and they return to school. So if, for example, they're sick at home, ordinarily the doctor would charge them 20 Rand. If they have medical aid, they'll only pay 2 Rand. Medical aid is highly recommended during the course of the game for the children and continue to try and sell it to them. There's also dental aid for an additional 15 Rand. And here, if children, for example, are going to be getting braces during the course of the game, they will only be required to pay 10% of the 200 Rand fee. Both medical aid and dental aid together cost a total of 45 Rand and the children can choose whether to use it or not. Now that they've got a house, they have the following further privileges. They can purchase a hawker's license and they can now write their driver's license. The driver's license, as I mentioned previously, they need to go to the website, they need to download the driver's license handbook and study it. When they feel they're ready, they can pay 30 Rand to the bank and write the license. The license test itself is a 12 mark general knowledge test. If they pass, they get their driver's license with the driver's license card. If they fail, they don't get their license obviously and they have to continue paying bus fare. The good thing about a driver's license is that if they've done the work, they no longer have to pay that 10 Rand bus fare per week. A hawker's license is a license that can be purchased from the bank. It costs 10 Rand per week. Okay? It only lasts a week, and during this week, they can then sell homemade goods for cash uh, during break time. This means chocolate brownies, hot chocolate if you're playing during winter, any cupcakes, anything that they've made themselves, they can bring it to school and they can sell it for real life for kids' cash. It's important that these items are homemade as we don't want to get a situation where some kids are able to access certain things from certain shops and bring them for sale. It makes the game skewed and unfair. Another critical point is only allow players to purchase two Hawker's licenses throughout the duration of the game. As we know, some parents have more time than others, and sometimes they'll get involved more than others, so it's unfair on those pupils who don't have that kind of support. A maximum of two Hawker's licenses for the duration of the game is key. Right, we now have the next impact point in the game, and that's for the city tenders. I asked the kids, what is required to make up a city? So we give examples like a school, a hospital, a jail, a police station. All these kind of things are required in the city. Here, I then teach them how the tender process works. I usually use the example of an airport. If I need an airport to be built in my city, I put this out to tender. And various construction companies then tender to build that particular airport. I use the example of my first tender that comes in. They come in at 100 Rand and they'll build it in three days. My next tender comes in at 500 Rand and they'll take five days. My final tender said they'll take 10 days and they'll charge me 1,800 Rand. I put it to the kids which one they would choose and more often than not they choose the 100 Rand one being built in three days. I then discuss the pros and cons of this. What kind of an airport am I going to get that costs 100 Rand and built in three days? It's not going to last and it's going to be of poor quality. The other tender that said that they'd build it in 10 days for 1,800 Rand is way too expensive, way unaffordable and takes too long to build. However, 
The one that said they'd build it for 500 rand in five days is an excellent tender and they would win the award. I give this guideline so they have some idea of how much to charge me when they're going to be building their tenders. I then put them into pairs or threes depending on the size of the tender and the reason why we have allow threes is some children don't group well and if you can see they're not in a group you can merely move them into a tender group quite easily. They then need to decide what they would like to build in the city, how long it will take them and how much they're prepared to do it for. They have a first choice, a second choice and a third choice and they submit those tenders to the teachers. The teachers then decide what was the best price for the best value and they award these tenders to the pupils. Most children won't get their first choice tender but they'll either get their second or their third. If children tender really badly, make sure that they get at least something to build. Don't allow more than 10 days for the tender. A maximum of 10 days, but I recommend, once again, a week. Now you can choose to do this at school on maybe a tender morning, take a Friday from 8 o'clock till 12 o'clock. They bring in all their materials and they build them themselves. Alternatively, depending on the time in your curriculum, they can once again meet on a weekend and build these together. That's up to you. Not all tenders may be necessarily taken up. And what you can do is when the children bring in their tenders and they are according to specification, you can then refloat those tenders that are still available and give them the opportunity to once again build the remaining tenders. There's a wide range of tenders, 12 in all, so this suits a class of about 25 to 30 perfectly. Every child must be involved in the tender process and this is where they can get their money. It's also important to know that if they tender for 600 Rand and there's two of them in the group, they only each get 300 Rand. So they've got to make sure that they are tendering correctly and that it's worth their while. Some of the tenders that are available we have of course the airport, over here we have the game reserve, up at the top there the golf course, we have a lighthouse, a hotel, a casino, an office towers and many many others. These can be found on the website for both the children and for the teachers. There are some additional bonuses for the tenders if the children can do certain things. So for example, in the school, if they can produce a working bell, they'll get an extra 100 Rand bonus. The same relates to the airport. If they can make the runway light up, they'll get an extra bonus of 100 Rand on top of their tender. Each particular tender has a related bonus feature that the children can or cannot take advantage of. Last pieces of vacant land you'll see on the board are reserved for businesses. Children can purchase a piece of land on auction and create a business. These businesses relate to the children's general school day. So for example, if they own the stationery shop, they can invoice the teacher for any stationery that's handed out during the school day. For example, worksheets, the teacher will be invoiced and have to pay the stationery shop. There's also a travel agency so every time the children move from their form class to another class, they'll be invoiced and have to pay the stationery shop. There's a hardware, so any improvements that are made will be charged to the hardware. All these terms and conditions on what they can charge each other are laid down in the terms and conditions of their business, and these can be found on the website. You'll notice that the board is divided by a river running through the middle. People on the right-hand side of the board cannot access people on the left. For this, we launch the bridge building competition. A good idea is to get hold of your art teacher and get them to do it as a project during the course of the game. On the website are loads of resources in terms of bridge design and construction for the teachers to use. 
During the competition, the winning bridge not only will receive a cash prize, but will also get the honour of placing their bridge on the board for the duration of the game. There are second prizes, as well as third prizes, as well as creativity prizes. See the website for further details. Hopefully by this time, your kids have chosen a name for your town. Mine is rather egotistically called Grahamstown. And now it's time to elect a mayor of the city. This is a really strong cross-curricular tool because you can hook up once again with your English department because the children need to deliver an electoral speech trying to convince their fellow citizens why they should be elected mayor of the city. Each child must get up and deliver an oral as to why this must be so. It's a good idea to possibly take this in as an oral mark for the term. In conjunction with this, get hold of your IT department and get the children to do election posters which they can put around the school with a photo of themselves saying why they should be mayor with an election slogan. For example, vote for me, I'll set you free. This all creates a little bit of election hype and on the day of the election and the election speeches, it kind of makes things more exciting. Finally, get the children to vote on a secret ballot for the mayor of their town. The person with the most votes becomes the mayor. With that, they get an extra 20 rand per week for doing their duties, and second and third place become town councillors for the game. They receive an additional 10 rand per week. What are their jobs? Well, firstly, they need to make sure that the board or the city is always looking clean and tidy. They can also negotiate with the teacher over issues like bus fare, insurances, or any unfair costs that may arise during the course of the game. At any point in the game, you can also introduce the stock exchange. Here, pupils can buy shares in various fictitious businesses in terms of what they would like to purchase. These businesses relate to what's happening in the real world. So for example, there's a business related to the taxi industry. So if the petrol price in real life goes up or down, those shares will either go up or down. There's a technology company, so if Apple or Samsung bring out the latest technology, that share price could go up. One related to the gold price. You as the teacher can decide and manipulate the shares accordingly. Once children buy shares in a company at a fixed price, they will receive a share certificate and can buy and trade those shares accordingly whenever they require. This is an optional module, but something that really is fun and really good to do. Right, now we've come to the end of the game. The first thing you as the teacher have to do is close the bank. Okay? Choose a specific day, get all the children to deposit as much money as they have into the bank because this becomes important right at the end of the game. Now we issue the children with assets registers. On these registers, they register all their properties, all their insurances, and even if they have a driver's license, they'll place this down on the assets register. I will then purchase back each individual property from the players at an increased value, depending on the effort they've made. Starting at Slim Park number one, I will purchase back their land and then give them a percentage increase up to 50% depending on the effort that they've put into their property. I then purchase back their house. Obviously, if they live in Slim Park, it would be 50 Rand, and I will then increase that value so they get a return on their investment. I then purchase back their garden, their fence, their satellite dish, anything that they've invested energy in, I will then purchase back from them at an increased value and they'll make some money. I move through all the properties, buying back their land, houses, etc., until I get to the final property, which is Cliffview, and purchase all of their assets back. We then purchase back, as I said, their driver's license, any insurances that they may have, and this will give them a final total. I then combine this with the money that they have in their bank accounts and it will give them a final net value. This will range from the person in the class with the lowest amount of money to the person in the class with the highest amount of money. An example of the assets register and how to do it 
is available to you as the teacher on the website. That's not the end of the game though. We now introduce the students to tax. Each student is issued with a tax return form which they have to fill in and there are certain tax deductible items which they can put forward. Obviously, as in real life, the more money they have, the more money they get taxed. We don't tax them a lot, but it's a good lesson to be learned anyhow. We then finally have, after tax has been taken off, we have our winner, the person who has the most net worth in the game, as well as various other prizes. We have a range of certificates available to you on the website, from financial winners to people who have embraced a green concept to community-minded, a participation certificate. And then finally, I have a generic blank certificate because you teachers may need the flexibility to create your own prizes and your own winners. I have a winner per grade in my school and they are given their certificates with a cash prize at prize giving at the end of our year. That brings us to the end of the game. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If there are any questions that you need to ask, please visit our site, www.reallifeforkids.com, and we'll answer any further questions that you may have. Also, you have a training manual where further detail can be found on any issue surrounding the game. The game, of course, is also available in Afrikaans, but I'll show you more about that in the website. Thank you.